Today we're mostly, actually not just today, but the three remaining lectures, we're going to deviate from the book. Uh, and the reason for that is twofold. First, there are some things that we've realized. Some things like this are much more modern than the book, and they're also a bit more applied. Um, but we don't teach this in any other course, and this is important for you. Even if you're not necessarily going to be working with theoretical research yourself, this is an integral part in a lot of the things we do to eventually get translational research into patients, um, biotech applications or anything. And because this is, whether you're going to do it or not, it's important for you to be aware of A, the possibilities and B, the limitations. Because even if you're not going to do this in your team, in all likelihood, there's going to be somebody either in your team or a team that you work with who's going to be working on techniques like this. And I'm also going to speak a little bit in particular about G protein coupled receptors, which are we occasionally lie. We say that membrane proteins are the most important drug targets. That's technically correct, but that's just because GPCRs are the really important drug targets and they just happen to be membrane proteins. And then tomorrow I'm going to be speaking a little bit about free energy techniques, which are still, they are used in industry, but that's pretty much the up and coming technique, which is the more advanced version of docking. And then on Thursday, we're going to be speaking about both nucleic acids and a bit of how to handle errors in real data, Star standard errors, standard deviations, and all these things. But before we go there, we're going to speak about what we said yesterday. Thirteen questions. I had this great idea, but I'm not going to be able to do that until Thursday. That I am, so when we're once a year, we have a meeting at NVIDIA, and then they have this great app at the podium, they have this big bowl full of candy. And the whole idea, when any time somebody in the audience asks a question, they throw them a piece of candy. <laughs> I should have thought of that at the beginning of the course. Uh, but no candy today. But let's go through the questions. What's the difference between transition states and folding intermediates? Fun way to wake up in the morning. So if you draw a plot like this, is that a transition state and that a folding intermediate? No, that's not enough. Exactly. While transition states are then. Yeah. And why is that difference important? Not just that we can't get over the transitions, right? You can never observe a full, a, you can never observe a transition state directly. It's impossible because you're not going to spend any time there. You can indirectly derive information about it from how long it takes to get over these barriers. While folding intermediates, we can observe. I'm not saying that it's easy, but it's technically possible to observe them. So then we had the Svante plots, Svante Arrhenius. Versus the temperature or something else? The versus the inverse temperature, right? And, and this is a difference between the Arrhenius and the Chevron plots that I didn't specifically mention. The Arrhenius plots, they always try to get at this property that you have some sort of rate constant that's proportional to an exponential raised to E minus delta, let's say, F divided by KT. And you always try to get to that delta f expression by taking the logarithm of both sides, and then you have delta f divided by k, and the, but also one over, minus one over t there. So we plot them either uh, versus one over t or minus one over t, and then they become straight lines. What's the problem with that in particular for protein folding? And in particular, well, not whether it, the problem it's doing both, right? We're having some molecules folding and other molecules unfolding. So in general, protein folding at the temperatures we study is a balance. And that's a bit unlike most other chemical processes. Most other chemical processes, like solving a salt or something, they are 
so displaced either towards the left or the right part of the equation that there, it's a pretty good approximation to argue that the reaction is only going one way. But that doesn't hold for protein folding, in particular at this intermediate temperatures where both things are happening. And that in turn, let's see, I don't, ask, I don't ask that question specifically, but that in turn is related to this thing that at high temperature you unfold, the unfolding is faster. But at low temperature, the folding goes faster, right? So that there, by definition, there will be this crossover temperature where suddenly folding is faster than unfolding or vice versa. Most normal chemical reactions, all of them speed up with temperature. So the only, diff the only question then is that, is it lower free energy to be in salt or in uh, solution? So how do we solve that with chevron plots? Mm -hmm. So as we derived a bit that it turns out that the effective folding rate that is the folding rate that corresponds to the balance between the left and right side, the one that also includes the reaction that goes the wrong way, will actually correspond to the sum of the, uh, of the rates. Um, and the point with the Chevron plot is that there was another thing we generalized here. So this is the effective rate. But the other thing that we generalized, rather than just putting one over temperature here, it can be anything here. Or not quite anything, but concentration of a denaturant, anything that influences the reaction going back or forth. So here we're not literally trying, here we're not only trying to plot this as a, getting the free energy directly as a function of one over temperature, but anything that has to do with the folding or unfolding, and that's when we get these curves. And it actually doesn't go that way, but it goes that way. Uh, so based a bit on these plots and everything, uh, even last week we spoke a bit how the enthalpy and entropy, how they vary during folding. Sorry, I can see I already answered number six here. Enthalpy and entropy during folding. We might have, uh, which is surprising because then I would assume eight people here immediately saying what the answer was. <laughs> yes? And the entropy? Yeah. So both of them go down, right? And they go down at roughly the same rate. If they didn't go down at roughly the same rate, you would end up either getting stuck in the unfolded state or having a very large barrier. Um, so that the small remaining peaks has to do with the differences, the deviation from, say, the linear drop. We spoke about this phi value. What is it? Can you just repeat the use of the apparent folding hmm? So the point of the apparent folding rate is to get away from using this Arrhenius plots, right? And if we wanted to use Arrhenius plot, we would somehow need to find a way, in particular in this crossover region. And the reason why the crossover region is important is that if I introduce a mutation here, we're going to have things that are quite close to each other. So interesting things happen in the crossover region. But in the crossover region, it's virtually, in the Arrhenius plots, it's impossible to measure one curve without the other influencing us, unless you had some super complicated piece of equipment. So that the reason why we want the chevron plots is that, that I would like to measure the total rate that also accounts for the things that go in the wrong direction. Hmm? So if you had the Arrhenius plot, the Are in theory, if we could measure how much protein is folded without accounting for the part that some of it that has folded will also go in the other direction. So if you could somehow, the second a protein has, has been folded, if I could remove it from the test tube, then I could measure things just with an Arrhenius plot, saying measure the fluorescence or something. The problem is that doesn't work in practice, because when a protein has folded, for most other chemical reactions, 99.99999% everything will just fold. We don't have anything, any reaction going the wrong way. But for proteins, 
some of the proteins that have folded will also unfold, in particular when you're at the crossover point when it's 50-50. And that screws up the Arrhenius plots. Uh, we, we're not going to get that. When, when I drew the red plot, you might remember that it was one black and one red curve, right? But that assumes that you could measure the red curve without the black one interfering. In practice, you're going to end up with horrible things when the black curve starts to interfere with the red or vice versa. So what we do with chevron plots is that we kind of cheat. So all the chevron plots measure is that how fast are things going over the barrier, either to the left or to the right. We don't care. Oh, that sounds really stupid. Uh, but that's why you end up with these strange things that if you're very much to the left here, right, we are folding and it's high. But if you think you're to the right, we have the same value. And this might be 50 per second or whatever. But it's 50, here it's 50 per second unfolding, here it's 50 per second folding. And if you hadn't seen the plot, that would seem insane. What do you mean 50 per second? Yeah, 50 molecules per second cross the barrier. Anyway, <laughs> any direction, either folding or unfolding, we don't care. And, but the reason why that works is, again, because you had this clear separation. When we were out here, all of you will know that at 10 molar guanidinium hydrochloride, all those 50 molecules per second crossing the barrier, they're going to be unfolding, I promise. And same thing here at zero molar, right? All those 50 molecules per second crossing the barrier, they're going to be folding. And right here, there are 50, 50, so it's kind of 25 folding and 25 unfolding. And this sounds very strange until we start to realize that what I'm after, I'm not really interested in that where there's 29 molecules per second going over the barrier. I could not care less. But what I can use these plots for is to understand the differences. So that, and in theory, in particular here, I can extrapolate, because again, up here it's only folding, right? So if I extrapolate that curve, that curve should correspond to the rates if I'm only folding. While this curve should correspond to the rate when I'm only unfolding. So the point is that this is something that's easy to measure. I measure both reaction constants and just sum them up. And I can still get all the important data just by extracting them from the plot. <coughs> and then the exact way you extract this from the plot, that was a bit of detail. Uh, we went through it yesterday in the slides, and they're well mentioned in the book too. But the important part here is to understand what phi f is. So what did I use the plots for? So that's the answer to number eight, right? We want to we understand whether this particular residue is part of the transition state. Yeah. We want to know whether residue 49 is part of the transition state. And the, reason, the way we get that for residue 49 is that I take residue 49 and I try to mutate it to some other residue, anything. And what then will happen is that, in general, there will be things changing, right? But there are three things that can change, the unfolded state, the transition state barrier, or the folded state. So if I'm only changing the stability of the folded state relative to the unfolded state, I don't care because that should not influence the barrier. Um, but that can again happen by either by making the folded state better or the unfolded state worse. So what I'm interested in is what fraction of this change is present already in the transition state. Because if it's not present, if there is zero percent of this present in the transition state, this might be a great or horrible change in the residue. I don't care about the sign, but it only influences the ultimate stability of the protein. It doesn't influence the speed with which the reaction happens. While if the change, if I mutate residue 49 here, if that is a change already in the transition state, then residue 49 was obviously part of this transition state. So the reason why we need to determine that separately, if I try to only measure, say, the height of the transition state, that might seem obvious, right? But what might have happened there is that I just changed the unfolded state instead. And if, of course, if I change the unfolded state, I will effectively have changed the barrier in the transition state. But it's not really that I changed the transition state, it's just that I changed the unfolded states. And that's why we need to take this difference. So that I check how much does this residue change the transition state versus how much did it change the stability of the folded state. 
And the easiest way to think about this is that that leads to a result between zero and 100%. That's not strictly true because you can have differences in sign. You can have more than 100%, etc. But think of it between zero and 100%. So if this is 100%, this was a residue that was part of the core of the transition state. Pretty much the first few residues forming it. If it was 50%, it was still a residue involved in the transition state, but maybe in the outer parts. And if it's 0%, this residue is not part of the transition state. And again, this way we can take a structure. We don't know the structure of the transition state, but I can take the structure of the known protein, the final folded protein, and map out, color, what residues in this protein were the nuclei, the nucleus, the first one to start forming. For instance, the beta sheet, we could show that the beta sheets that insert in a membrane, they too, they have the small band of residues around the beta sheet, and that is where the residue structure starts forming. I can't determine the structure, but I can determine that that is the first part of the structure that must have started to form. And if you ever wanted to change, say, the, the speed with which a protein folds or influence a process or something, these are, of course, the residues that you want to go after, right? Trying to change the stability or how quickly a protein folds. Basically, if the, re if the residue has a phi value of zero, forget about it. It's not going to be important for the rate of folding of that protein. Number nine, enthalpy-entropy balance. We touched upon it a little bit, but this doesn't hurt to repeat. Exactly, and it has to do, we call this concept a couple of different things, in particular folding funnels or pathways or guided, and so that we're basically, we're gradually going down in the energy landscape. And the point again, if the energy drops too quickly, we will get stuck in some relatively low energy state, but if the entropy drops too quickly, the free energy barrier will be too high. So they need to go down, both of them, roughly at the same pace. If they went down at exactly the same pace, though, the effective free energy barrier would be zero, and then you would not have stability. So the reasons why proteins are stable and the way, the way we have a barrier is that the entropy tends to drop over a fairly narrow region when the chain starts to intersect with each other and bump into each other. And because the free energy is the enthalpy minus the entropy, that effectively creates this barrier. And that barrier, we argued, can explain Leventhal's paradox, at least in one of these models, the nucleation condensation. So you don't necessarily need to use the equations here, but how could the nucleation condensation model explain Leventhal's paradox? Mm -hmm. So we can use a little bit of equations. Um, what I would, and I, I think this is a good example where equations actually make it easier. If you just had a volume that being folded, um, the energy would drop roughly as, so that energy would be proportional to the number of residues, right? And the number of residues there well, the volume, the volume in the space would be proportional to the radius cubed, which is proportional to the number of residues. What the nucleation condensation model argued, when you're forming this gradual core, initially, the number of interactions you have are rather going to be proportional to the area rather than the volume. So that means that you also have some sort of second term here that is roughly proportional to the number of residues raised to the power of two thirds. Because that's the volume and that's the area of the region. And then we, I also made a hand-waving argument that roughly the same thing holds for entropy. So that the amount of residues you have locked in, if you have a large volume, is going to be proportional to the number of residues. The number of, when you're just starting this, the number of residues that we're effectively locking in is more proportional to the area. 
And the way, one other way you can think about that is that if there are only a handful of residues formed there, if I add one more residue, that residue is not going to be entirely buried, right? If you have a large area, most residues inside, the, sorry, large volume, most residues that are in this core will be entirely buried, and then it's proportional to the volume. When you're forming this, all the residues on the surface will not be buried. And that's, at least with a bit of hand waving, we can argue that it's more proportional to the surface. And this goes back to Leventhal's paradox. So the Leventhal's paradox really had to do with the number of states that we needed to test was some sort of number, say the number of different Ramachandran torsions or something, raised to the number of residues, those terms. And then we argue that what happens when you take the energy minus the entropy, those terms roughly cancel. So that the remaining terms we have are going to be proportional to the number of residues raised to two-thirds. So if you then would make this into Leventhal's paradox, the, uh, the free energy then would be roughly proportional to E raised to something that is not N, but raised to N to the power of two-thirds, and that should not be. And whether, sorry, not necessarily E there, but something X, whether that is the number of Ramachandran torsions or so. So the point is that this will, we will not have n in the exponent. You can have, whether it's n raised to the power of two-thirds or something, the exact number here is, of course, an approximation, right? But the point is that it will not grow as n. And that's effectively what cracks Leventhal's paradox. Sorry. Hmm? Uh, why is it x not e? Remember when we drew the Ramachandran torsions? And if I had a large chain, say 100 residues, and then we ask, what are the number of different states that we need to test here, right? And then I argued, if you want to make this really simple, you could argue that there could be two states, or maybe three. So if you have 100 residues, the number of different things you needed to test there would be, say, 2 raised to the power of n, or maybe 3 raised to the power of n. Whether it's exactly 2 or 3 doesn't really matter. The argument I made at the beginning of the course that the important part here is this number, because it's this number that causes us to, to the complexity to explode. So there's going to be some small number here, and exactly what this doesn't matter. Say it's between 1 and 10. It's not going to be 500. Even if it was, this number is not going to change the shape of the curve, how quickly it grows. It will make it larger, but it's this number that decides how quickly it grows. So what we effectively did now is, again, I haven't changed the proportionality here or anything, but it's this number that is no longer n, but rather n raised to the power of two-thirds instead. And then I, yesterday we formulated a bit this a bit more accurately. In particular, we formulated it in terms of delta G or delta F. And there we actually, if you're talking about reaction rates, right? Sorry. The reaction rate K that we argue that that is going to be proportional to E raised to plus delta F divided by KT. So if we formulate it in terms of reaction rates as that, then we really have E. So then we would have that K that is proportional E raised to, if that free energy was now proportional to the number of residues raised to the power of two-thirds, we would have another constant <laughs> raised to N to the power of two-thirds. So sorry, I might, I might have been a bit unclear there. If you talk about the number of states, it's x, some sort of low number. If you're talking about reaction rates, then it's definitely e. Does that make sense? For once. Good. We spoke a little bit about these network models for folding. I have a couple of uh, extra slides that I included. That uh, So let's wait with that one. Um, when are proteins thermodynamically versus kinetically stable? Actually, you know what? I think it's going to be easier to handle all of these if I show you the slides. I've drawn some networks here. The number here are different states, and I've written the free energy as a sort of arbitrary scales between them. And this is still highly simplified. Duh, understatement of the year. Um, so let's try to understand what's going to happen here and what the different states are. And in a real network model, we would have like maybe 500 circles like this. And that, that would take a while to go through. So that's, I think you'll agree that it's easier to do it this way. What would this mean? What are the different things? And what is the 
initial state, side states, the native state? Are there an intermediate states or transition states here? Yep. So this is a sort of reference state that we start from. Um, and I've deliberately called that zero, yep. Well, mm, so are these really intermediate states? They're higher in free energy, right? So here you're just going up on a barrier. So all these states are bad. If you are there, the best thing would actually be to fall back. No, I'm saying that. So here we're actually monotonously climbing up, climbing up. This would be an even larger peak that we're never going to visit. And then here, this is an even larger off path where if you go there, you will pretty much immediately go back, right? And then we're going to be happier. So this, this is essentially, this is a fairly simple transition. In theory, you can take two molecules and put them on top of each other and get to a very bad state. And if that ever happens, we're instantly going to go back on path. So while there is a barrier here, it's a fairly simple barrier. Theoretically, there are things you could go out to the side, but you're not really going to do that. If you go out to the side, we will immediately go back here. So in this case, so the circles here are just, think of them as snapshots. I've taken, a, I've taken a movie, captured your molecule in one state, and said what the free energy is here. Because if you can go between 0 0.5 and 7.2, and 1.2 and 0 0.9, you're always, both of these states will immediately fall down to the 0 0.5, which should immediately fall down to that one, right? So you're never going to be stuck there. So 1.2 would be the highest transition state, and that's what we need to pass there, right? Because there is no way to get from start to end without going through that state. So that is going to be the worst state here that we need to go through. That's an even worse state, but we don't have to go through that state. So we're not going to spend any time there, but that state we do have to go through. So let's look at the second example here. What happens now? So the difference is up here, right? <laughs> what will that be? An intermediate. Well, is it an intermediate or? Yep. Well, intermediate state would be a state that you had to visit. So I would say this is probably a misfolded state rather, right? It's not good to be here. You would prefer, it would be better if you could go here, but based on how good or, well, it's good free energy wise, but it's bad for your path. So that, that is basically a hole you fall into that we would prefer not to fall into. Do you see how things get more complicated where you can imagine that when there are multiple connections between them? In one dimension, it's very simple because you have to go through all states. But in reality, there are many forks in the road here. So if you start out here, you're going uphill, you're going uphill, and then we could go a little bit downhill and fall there. But it's also possible that you take a detour here and end up in this state which is bad. And if you're now here, then we'll have to wait until you spontaneously start going back. And when you're here, you might either go back here or you go back here. In theory, this is something you could simulate with those simple models that you played around with at the beginning of the course. So which one of this is going to fold fastest? Yep. So this will be a much slower process, right? Because you can end up with lots of molecules going the wrong way here which corresponds to what I showed you yesterday, that if there are bad states that have too low energy, I'm not really changing the energy of the transition state per se, and I'm not really changing the energy of the folded state. But because there are misfolded states, it's going to be slower for me to reach the good one. Let's see if we have a couple of more ones. Um, So what happens here? Now I deliberately change the path a bit. So here it's a clear intermediate state, right? Because I deliberately cut off this connection. I have to go through that state. And now the barrier here goes from minus 3.4 to plus 1.2. So that's 4.6. So it's going to be a very high barrier. And it's this barrier that's going to determine how long it takes to fold. Or you can look at it this way. 
and here you have something that's 0 to 0 0.9 and I go, so what type of process is this going to be? It's going to be much faster, right? So that the only transition state we have here is the 0 0.9. But we still measure virtually, all, sorry, we still visit virtually all of these. So that while the starting state and the ending state are the same for all of these four plots, they have very different properties in terms of folding. And if you think about this is not just theoretical, well, sorry, I have two more, my bad. <laughs> I couldn't, <laughs> what can I say? It's fun <laughs> when you get started. Um, what happens here now? And I, of course, these are completely fake examples, right? But that's a really good state. It's a really low free energy, right? So this could almost be something like a prion. And again, I should probably have made that barrier much higher. But the point is that we're going to be pretty happy there. You might even be happy here so long that that protein would have, you could even imagine that, that could, might very well be a biologically active state. And then after a very long time here, you would eventually go over this barrier too. I should have made this a bit higher. And of course, yes, if you are there, you're going to be happier there. But it might take a long time for you to make that final transition. And this is the last one, I promise. What will happen here? And this is, of course, much more realistic, right? Because in theory, there is nothing. Why, why, should I, why should I not be allowed to move directly between these states? In particular, if you have 100,000 variables or something. And that's why it's the last one. So this is the network we spoke about, right? that there, are, there is more than one way where all those roads lead to Rome. So if we start at the zero, which path am I mostly going to take? So that's better, right? And then I might have a little bit of flow there too. And all the ones that are at 0 0.7 is going to go to the 1.2. Now, if I am at the 1.5 here, I might either go down there or there might be a little bit of flow here. And when I am there, I will mostly go there. I might go a little bit there too. And again, when I'm here, all of them, both of them will go there, and a little bit will go there. So the point is that you're going to have arrows everywhere. But the relative rate here is going to be larger. So the most molecules will go this way. So this path, is this path bad then, the top path? Let's make a theoretical argument that this is your molecule that you start out with. And then Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Lindahl go into the lab and I kill that reaction. And I kill that reaction. What's going to happen? Will the protein fold faster or slower? slower. Why? Because it's parallel. Exactly. Parallel. And that has to do with the book describes this, and we spoke a little bit about it when, when I introduced kinetics, right? If there are multiple independent paths, if they are serial, I have to go over all the barriers. But if they are parallel, I can choose any road. So let's imagine if you have a traffic uh, jam going out of Stockholm, and then you open one more small road. Sure, it's not going to help a lot, but the total flow will be a bit better. So that even if this is an off path, off the main pathway, a little bit, say 10% of the flow, will actually go that way. And the reason for mentioning that is not necessarily that this path is super important, but for two paths it might not make sense, but a real protein might not have two paths. There might be 20 paths with small differences. And when we say one path, same thing here, you can think of the paths as a sort of macroscopic way. 
that doesn't mean that along this path that every single atom will have to move in exactly the same fashion every single time the protein folds, right? That there are, think about this as the general features in the landscape. Most proteins will go along the freeway and then there are some protein paths that will take other paths. So in general, it's, it's hard to start to change. For protein folding, it can help us understand why the proteins fold they do. When it comes to engineering or anything, Understanding exactly what paths we would take is difficult and it's not necessarily obvious that you're completely going to change the molecule even if I cut out that path, right? Because even if I cut here, the protein will still be able to fold and it's not going to be that much worse because that barrier is not incredibly much higher than that one. So this is, of course, it's not natural selection or anything. We have the same protein, but if there are multiple reaction pathways possible for it, we will predominantly follow the lowest transition state barrier. Let's see if there were some other questions we didn't cover there. So that, I think that explains 11. Um, thermodynamic versus kinetic stability. I know I have asked it before, but these are important questions. And, it's, and I'm also realized you've had a lot of information by now in the course, and that's why it's worth rehashing. So what is this thermodynamic versus kinetic stability? And when is it important? Thermodynamic stability, if you let it go in an infinite time, where will it go? Mm -hmm. And kinetic stability is? So do you now see that based on this, why we thought it was so fascinating with these results from membrane proteins, that we started to see that in some cases, it appears that the helices that insert in membrane proteins might not actually be thermodynamically stable in the protein, oh, sorry, in the, in the membrane. But it might rather be that the under some circumstances, at least it appears that the translocon help us achieve kinetic stability, and then we don't need the thermodynamic stability. So that was, uh, I'll, re I'll repeat that. Remember that we had the membrane, right? And the translocon can't change the free energy of the helix in the membrane. That's impossible because free energy is a state variable. But this helix that we had here, the top and bottom of my helix here, they have exposed peptide bonds. So if some way, if by some, let's call it magic, if by some magic way I can place my protein here, and now should I make my membrane thinner, sorry. Didn't normalize it by pen size. <laughs> That's my memory. If I have my two helices here, once they are inserted, they're not going to like to be pushed up because then I would expose the lower hydrogen bonds to the uh, membrane. Uh, sorry, the pep unpaired peptide bonds groups here. And if I push them down, I would also expose polar things to the inside of the membrane. So effectively, <laughs> If I could choose between being here and out in the water, I might very well be out in the water. But the free energy barriers to get there are so high that in practice I'm going to stay over very long time scales in here. And the magic would then be, and again, this is not true for membrane proteins in general. Most membrane proteins are hydrophobic. But what the translocon would then help us achieve is that if we can create the insertion in a way where I would not need to expose them to the, uh, if I could insert them this way and then somehow gradually diffuse out in the membrane, the translocon helps us avoid that very high free energy barrier, but it can not change the minima. And again, full disclosure, this is widely believed, meaning that some and P I and some other people think that this is this case for some helices in membrane proteins. It's certainly not generally true. Yep. So it doesn't change the barrier, it doesn't the, the minima. It so can't change the minima. Why can't it change the minima? So the, the minima of the memory protein proteins the minima. Yes, uh, as I say, why can't it change the minima? Uh, but it's even broader than that. What, is, what was free energy? I had a name for that. A general property of physics. It, 
actually it's a state variable, right? So it only depends on the state, not the path by which you got to the state. But doesn't that contradict what I said? I, because we just said that it could change the free energy barrier. But then I'm, then I'm changing the free energy. Exactly, right? So that I'm not changing the free energy barrier is a property of that state, right? So all the translocal helps me to do, it's not changing that state. It can't change that state because this is also a well-defined state. It's a transition state where we would not like to spend time. But I can't change the state. It's impossible. What I can do, though, the translocal can help me so I don't have to go through that path. So what the translocal here is effectively doing, think about the plot we just showed you. The translocal is helping us open up a different path which has lower free energy barrier. And the end state here is the same. So that the only, the only thing that the translocal would then do, it helps me get to the end state without going through that very, very bad transition state. But it can't change an individual state. It can just change the path. Yes? So it's just like a catalyst? A catalyst does exactly the same thing, right? A catalyst cannot change the energy, free energy. But a catalyst can help you so that you effectively find a different transition state so that you don't have to go through the old bad transition state. But none of this can change the free energy of a specific state. And then we occasionally, occasionally we are a little bit sloppy about this and I say that it changes the free energy barrier. But what that really means is that it changes the barrier I have to go over by finding a different barrier for me, a lower barrier. But the specific, no specific state can have its free energy changed because it's a state variable. Sorry, that was a bit of detour, but this explains why we were so fascinated by it. Uh, yep. One how, how do you know that uh, the is not at its uh, lowest or uh, most favorable thermodynamic state? So in general, we don't know. Uh, again, and, and that's why I have all these caveats. There are. Most membrane, for most membrane proteins, they are stable, right? And we know that because most of them are very hydrophobic. And by most, we talk about 99%. But as always in science, it's the exceptions that are very interesting because the exceptions tell us something important. And the exceptions we had found are particularly these helices, same voltage gated channels. We have four or five charges in the helix. So there are a few examples of these outlier proteins. And their exact stability, and again, this is still active research going on. We don't, I, I wish I could say that, I wish I could give you the answer here. This is still on the hunch level. Uh, we believe this is true. But whether this is just that, and it's also the individual helix that has lots of charges, right? So we need to be able to insert the individual helix and have that stable. But of course, so what was the case? This helix, red, uh, well, I need the blue one. <laughs> I don't have blue pens, blue is usually positive. So this helix with positive charge, the second it has been inserted in the membrane, right? We frequently had this other helix with negative charges being paired up. So it might very well be that this transient stability, we might only need to, this to be long-lived enough until it finds its partner. And that we don't know. But it's, a, it's still a super interesting research area. Uh, and there are room for tons of more PhD physicists in it. And some of the... Some of the hardest things are actually to do it experimentally, right? Because we have a hunch. We have, uh, we know roughly how it behaves. I would argue that there are even simulation models and everything, right? But I think what's needed here is one or two key experiments to try to prove this. Are they kinetically or thermodynamically stable? It would likely be a nature or science paper if you come up with a good way to do it. So what is then the role of this transition states in protein folding? They exert kinetic control over the process. They determine how fast things will fold. And conversely, right, they also exert the kinetic control in the other direction, such as the membrane. They determine how fast that you can unfold. So that brings us to today's topics, uh, drug design. And you know most of these things already. 
but now we're going to need to apply this a bit more. And I guess this is likely also, some of these things existed already when the book was written. But this is now a bit more, say, chemistry, modern computational chemistry, rather than the physical approach to it. So you can start from a sequence and predict the fold by either bioinformatics or some advanced simulation methods. Whether it's going to work, how accurate it is, is a separate issue. But you can at least try to do it. You could, say, build in the side chains and, say, even try to energy minimize the structure using things that you either have learned or will learn in the labs. You could do a, run a small simulation of this protein. Uh, so in principle, you could work with the protein. You could predict the energy and the entropy and everything. There are two problems with this. Um, first, this can teach you a lot about one specific protein molecule. But the problem is that you're gonna, still going to be limited to relatively short timescales. You might understand a bit about the protein moves. That is certainly important in many cases. But if you're going to design drugs, you might need to well, you might want to learn about processes that takes a second or something. Simply processes that are far beyond what we could simulate. You might also need to do this for 500 different mutants. Or worse, you might be searching for a new ligand and a drug. And you have no idea what the drug is. That's more common than you think. Uh, most, most features that happen in nature is that you find, sorry, most diseases that we want to treat end up with finding a protein that is involved in the process. That's not that hard. There are probably 100 unknown diseases where we know roughly what receptor protein is causing the disease, but that doesn't mean you can treat it. And now it's up to you to find something that to combat this drug, disease. For example, the, uh, the example I mentioned with this poor child at uh, Karolinska, right? We know the protein, we know the mutant, we know why it happens, but we have no idea how to treat it. And that's kind of the topic today. So drugs are superficially fairly easy. You have a target that is virtually always a protein. And nature does, or nature and your body does this all the time, that you have some small ligand or something. The ligand-gated ion channels is one example. It will bind to it. And once this binding happens, you elicit some sort of biological response. And that could be growth, if it's a growth hormone. It could be the opening of an ion channel or a hundred other processes. And the point of drug design is kind of to mimic this. It's rare that we bind to something completely new that has never been found in your body before. It does happen. You could imagine getting an antibody to bind to something to kill certain cancer cells or so. But mostly, it's much more efficient to try to find something that's a normally occurring target in your body and see if we can bind to the same thing and create the biological response. The problem here is that we don't know what the yellow part is. You're going to need to design a yellow part. The way this virtually always happens is that you start from a genome study. I'm oh, sorry, I should have had a sequence here, but you start from a genome study and then you find today, I would say, not 20 years ago, but today we find a genome study and say that, that you find out there are certain mutations or something that are related to disease. You might even build some biological networks and realize that this is a very complicated, say, tumor or something. And you're going to study this in the next course, I think, on comparative genomics. So if We've talked about proteins as sequences in the bioinformatics course. You talked about them as structures here, right? But let's point a protein as a small dot. This is the protein, Eric. This protein interacts with this other protein. And we can determine that either functionally or that they are expressed by the same levels or something. There are experiments to find out. But then there are more proteins in your body like 20,000, right? And we can actually, you can imagine starting drawing networks in proteins too. So that what proteins tend to co-vary or something. And then you might realize in this particular cancer disease, say that that protein, all these five proteins are involved, but that is really the hub. That is the most important protein that appear to always be required for the process. And then that might be the protein we would like to go after and change how to interact. The first thing we need to do then is what? Usually. You need a structure. And this might change in the future, but today it's still we need a structure. And there I'm going to show you the second half today that there are examples where uh, pharmaceutical companies have paid a billion dollars to get a structure. 
because it's so important. Once you have a structure, you might, either, if you're lucky, you might actually already see something bound or we will see these pockets and somehow we need to design in a molecule that binds in this particular pocket of the structure that we now know to get something to bind there and create the effect. And hopefully at this point you have enough biological knowledge that we know where things should bind. And there are like hundreds of examples here. But if you look at it in the body, um, if you classify this, I think this is two, three, no, it's a 10 years old by now, sorry. All this part is G protein coupled receptors. 27% of all drugs on the market hit G protein coupled receptors. That's why we're going to talk about them later today. Uh, nuclear receptors and things, transcription factors. The one part that is growing here is actually ion channels. It's probably up to 20% or so now because we're learning more and more about the structure of ion channels. And if you just look at this in the course, it might sound horrible. Why should we just think about, say, receptors, GPCRs, and ion channels? Well, if you do buy that, you cover pretty much half the spectrum of all drug design in modern pharmaceutical sciences. So that part, it's not unimportant, and that might be your new Nobel Prize here, but if you have to take a pick as a company, target that or target that. It's not a very hard choice for a company. You're going to target that. Drugs can do a few different things. We kind of talked about this when we spoke about the ligand-gated ion channels, but we're using different terminology here. A drugs can either... So normally, if this is a receptor and this is some sort of biological activity, you could argue that the normal thing would be that the receptor is somehow activated. It starts cell division or whatever it is, right? So you have some sort of normal process here that I don't show you. By far, the most common receptor, uh, sorry, the most common drugs are inhibitors. And they do exactly what they say. They turn off the receptor so that you get down to the baseline again, the black part. And that's an inhibitor drug. Then there are examples that you call agonists. And agonists are drugs that they, they create the response, the same response. They turn on the receptor. And a full agonist would be the one that turned it on to 100%. You can imagine a partial agonist that only, say, turns it on to 75 or 50%. And there are also examples where you call them inverse agonists. An inverse agonist is something that causes a response, but it's the opposite of the normal biological response. So there are agonists, inhibitors, and inverse agonists. And all three of them are important. So it depends on what you want to achieve, right? If this is, say, if you're targeting a blood pressure drug, and we know that this receptor is one that increases your blood pressure, and if your blood pressure is too high, what is it that you would like to try to develop? An inhibitor or an inverse agonist, right, to reduce the effect. Or it's the opposite, blood pressure is a bad example, but assuming that it's in some sort of receptor where you would like to kickstart it more, get it to work better, and then you would like a drug that is an agonist. How difficult do you think it is to develop drugs like that? It's not that hard, and we're going to see it soon, but the problem is biology is way more complex than that. So that Finding something that binds to the target is frequently the easiest problem. But the reason why pharmaceutical companies are so large, why they have entire teams, is that first you need to make sure that your compound does not bind. Sorry, getting something to bind to a target is easy. Just make it small and hydrophobic. It's going to bind to a ton of places. Your place is going to be one out of 1,000. So the, sadly, it's also going to bind to 999 other places. Side effects. And that's the bad part. So it's not enough to design for something. This is frequently called the counter design or anti design. We need to make sure that it does not bind in the wrong places. And there are numerous examples in the medical literature of side effects of drugs, right? And the problem is that there might be a drug and the side effect might be rare. It might be a very rare genotype or something so that it's it actually happened in NSD, NSD, anesthetics a few years ago. There was a drug that even made it all the way to market. And then they realized there are cases where patients uh, get an anaphylactic shock and die on the uh, operating table. And then they had to pull the entire drug from the market. You also need to, if you eat the drug, the drug might need to get to your brain if it's a neuropharmacological drug. Why is that a problem? 
you have a blood-brain barrier and the whole point of the blood-brain barrier is to protect things from getting into the brain. So most drugs will not get to the brain. That's still an unsolved problem. So what, what we typically do now for very rare diseases, you pretty much have to inject things directly into the brain. Which you will do if it's a matter of saving your life, right? But it's not something you're going to do on a weekly basis going to the doctor. You also need to get something that's easy to the body. Again, you don't want to have to inject it because you will never, and this might sound harsh, but if, th if this is requires you to go to the doctor and get two injections per week, unless it's going to save your life, you're not going to do it. And then this will never fund all the cost of developing this. And ideally, you would like a very slow and steady release of the drug. Because otherwise, you get this very strong effect initially, and then it wears off. Uh, so that actually, by far, the best way of delivering a drug is the case where you can put a patch on your skin. But that usually doesn't work because most drugs will not go through your skin. So what this entire process is called is adamatox. Absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion. This is where most drugs fail. It's by far the most difficult part of drug design. And nowadays we're increasingly using computers to predict the adma and toxicity too. So drugs, there are a couple of handful rules. There is even a, uh, a rule for it called Lipinski's rules of five. Um, and this is very much hand-waving. This is all based on, not all based, mostly based on trial and error. So historically, all drugs have fulfilled this, that they are small. They have a molecular weight below 500, which means that they must be small enough that they can be transported in the blood and everything. They can't be too hydrophobic, because then they would never get into the bloodstream. You should have a few hydrogen bond donors, not too much, because there are too many hydrogen bond donors and receptor acceptors here, they would stuck, stick too much in other places. And they're not hydrophobic enough to bind to the hydrophobic patches. And do you see here that these are kind of contradictory, right? Because we also need the drugs to get into your cells. And if this is a brand new drug here, this might, there will likely not be any obvious transporter that's going to transport your drug into the cell. This has not led to a new drug in 20 years. It used to be that you went into the traditional way, find a new drug in the rainforest or something, purify the molecule and have it. It's too hard. So there are a bunch. Oh, we even have a bunch of them here. These are real drugs on the market, all of them. Typical small molecules, a bunch of hydrophobic rings here. And these rings are actually not a coincidence. I don't remember whether they have a slide about it, but this, if a drug was very long and large and free with a floppy chain, it would have a very high entropy when it is not bound, right? And when you then bind it, it would reduce its entropy too much. So for things to bind well, they have to be fairly rigid so that they don't lose too much entropy upon binding. So all of these things are things that you can buy, go out and buy, at least with a prescription. And historically, the way we developed all of these things is that you find something, not necessarily in the Amazonas, but actually you love, you love, but this is very common. 50 years ago, there was an entire department in Uppsala of uh, pharmacogenesis and everything, and they used to go down on expeditions and try to find things. Uh, because that this, is a very, this is a hidden gem of undiscovered plants and everything, right? And then you know that there was something that we not just Amazons, but even in Europe too, that there was some sort of, if you eat this plant, you know that uh, you get rid of your headache or that you would get less tired or something. And that is, of course, because there is some sort of molecule in this plant that does something. And then we would try to isolate this in a laboratory um, and then hopefully turn it into a blockbuster drug. And this can be harder than you think because it might actually turn out that that drug is technically poisonous, toxic. Uh, and the problem then is that you're going to need to find a way, can you find a way that saves, that retains the good properties while making the drug less toxic? And that's usually a matter of taking these drugs, adding a methyl group, trying to remove the oxygen there. Organic chemists are outstanding at this, and it's, they're certainly far more skilled than I am at it. So that's why you have entire teams. Can you imagine the, what, what is the universe of drug space? Like it's hundreds of billions of small compounds you could create, right? What this frequently leads to today, though, is that since this is very rare that happened, there are quite a few Me Too drugs. 
and me too, this has nothing to do with the recent debate, but uh, <laughs> so me too drugs is that basically your company has discovered a new drug that treats a high blood pressure. And you've done that by targeting receptor X. And my company then, I would prefer not to spend $5 billion to go after this. And I, oh shit, that is really efficient and it has very few side effects to go after that receptor. So maybe we should do it too. Now the problem is, of course, you have a patent on your drug, so I can't copy your drug. But I can choose to design another drug that binds in the same place where your drug binds. And you just had to do the, take the entire development cost and proving that this receptor was a good target and everything. So I know if I target the receptor you're targeting, my drug will likely make it to market too. So this is a way to do it way cheaper. Um, we can certainly try to, I might know that there is a particular receptor that I would like to target, but there is no known drug whatsoever that does it. And this is increasingly the most common scenario. And then I'm going to need to go down into the organic chemistry lab and we will try to design a new, brand new compound that has never existed in nature that will bind to the receptor in question and the illicit response I want, whether it's an agonist, inverse agonist, or inhibitor. This is hard because all of the reasons we mentioned on the Lipinski slide, right? And that's, as I've kind of hinted before in the course, this is not just the future. This is increasingly happening, but it's still very much on the research state we are increasingly designing protein drugs, small protein, parts of proteins that will bind to other proteins. This gets a specificity because of all the things that we've said in the course. Proteins are way more specific than these small molecules. But then you also have all these problems that, for instance, uh, administering the drug, you're gonna need to inject them because if you eat them, you're gonna digest the protein and all your enzymes will destroy it. So there aren't really I wouldn't, say that drug dis I wouldn't say that the pharmaceutical world is in a crisis, but it's far more difficult than it has been. And one of the reasons for that is that we don't accept side effects anymore. If you take a very simple, one of the simple ones, aspirin, there is no way aspirin would have been approved in the market today. It's too dangerous. Bleeding, uh, problems with that related to heart, overdoses and everything. But because it has been on the market for, what, 80 years or something, we accept it. So modern drug design is a bit different, actually. Um, so we first need this target. If this, so if this costs us a billion dollars, we will go after it. And that's most pharmaceutical companies, they don't randomly start to work with drugs for all different types of diseases. So as a pharmaceutical company, you tend to develop a profile. So that, say, my company is mostly interested in neuropharmacology or, say, blood pressure drugs or um, whatever, say, something related to acid reflux. Because that means that in this particular area that my company is working on, I might have three or four protein structures. Do you think I'm going to share those protein structures with the rest of the world? I just paid a billion dollars to get them. There is no way we're depositing them in the protein data bank. Because this is, again, it's a, it's a trade secret. So that because nobody else has this structure, I will be able to design drugs that you can't design. And then we're going to need to find some small molecule to start with. And that could pretty much be divine inspiration. Divine inspiration is usually not a very efficient way of designing drugs. So that if you write that at the exam, you're not going to get it right. Uh, computers is, of course, we use a lot of computers here. Find something, and I'll, I'll explain to you soon how we find it. Hopefully, this has some sort of effect, and it's not extremely toxic. The problem is that this is going to be inefficient. It's always going to be inefficient because the likelihood of finding something efficient randomly is nil. And then we need to optimize the drug. I'll, talk, I'll also cover what this inefficiency is soon. And as we optimize this, and this is fast, this entire process, optimizing it, we, most pharmaceutical companies, they have a cycle of say, four to eight weeks. So in eight weeks, I need to know what was the result of your previous testing, what looks most promising now, and what am I going to do in the next cycle, create the next round of drugs. And gradually, if this looks really promising, you would go first into the lab and start doing in vitro tests. And eventually, you would start doing animal tests if things still look really promising. Then you start going with, say, phase one studies. Is it safe in humans? Completely healthy, young humans. Phase two, is it efficient in humans? And efficiency, if we say, again, if I've developed a new drug for high blood pressure, 
at phase two, you start administering this drug to patients that actually have high blood pressure. And let's see, does it even reduce the blood pressure in humans? Sure, it did it in mice, but a mouse is not a human. And in phase three, the problem even, yes, this might reduce blood pressure, but the question is, is it even better than any drug you already have on the market? Because if this drug is not better than what's already on the market, I will likely not get it approved. There has to be some advantage over drugs that are already on the market or the Food and Drug Administration or Social Services we won't approve the drug. Forget about whether it approved it or not because a brand new drug is going to be very expensive, right? If it's a brand new, very expensive drug and it has no advantage whatsoever over an old drug that is cheap, who's going to buy my drug? Nobody. This process might take 10 years. You don't want to fail here. This is when companies go bankrupt. But the problem is fail you do. Preclinical testing, 70% of projects fail. Out of the 30% that make it here, something like 40% fail in phase one, meaning that it's dangerous. There is something that happened in humans. Out of the two thirds that make it here, another 60% fail that they don't really work in humans. It worked in mice, but for whatever reason, the human works differently. So it doesn't have the effect we hoped for. You see this in the stock market now and then, that there was this <coughs> discovery company X that they reported the results from their clinical studies and then the, the stock dropped by 40% because we were in the red, the study failed. While in some other cases, the stock will go up by 50% because it worked. Phase three, when things fail here, that's, this is the part where you've done studies over, say, 10,000 patients or something. And you can imagine what happens to the stock if you fail here. You've invested a billion dollars all the way, and it turns out that it doesn't work. We're going to need to cancel the entire project. And then there are some drugs where I, as a company, I think that this is really worth, it. it's really worth taking it to the market. But unfortunately, the authorities don't agree that they don't believe my tests. They don't think I have not enough studies. And here there is quite, there is unfortunately a bit of competition between say the Europe and the US. If you look at European newspapers, they are always upset that the US Food and Drug Administration tends to reject European drugs more than the US drugs. Because basically they're using us as a uh, trade negotiation to create an advantage for US companies. Really unfair. Until you look at what the European authorities are doing. They're doing exactly the same thing. They, are, they frequently reject US drugs more than European ones. And it's not just because this might, it's not just because of trade tactics and everything. A European company will likely have interacted mostly with the European authorities, right, when they developed the drug. And the US authorities or the, the Japanese authorities might have slightly different requirements. And what then might happen is that they might need to go back, take two more years and do another large phase three study. And while they're doing this, your patent time is ticking. And they're gonna be smaller and smaller period during which you will be able to make money in your drug. And the reason for the red part here, this is not bad. The red part here is great. Because when you fail here, this might be three people in the lab or something, you pay their salary for one year, it's nothing. You want to fail here. Because failing here means you found the problem here instead of finding it here. So failing early is failing cheap. There was an example, I think, I don't remember the company, I should mention the company name, this is recorded. A few years ago, this, uh, we had, there were some new, the drugs I mentioned, the anesthetics. And they failed because there were rare genotypes in patients so that under some very rare conditions, you get side effects that could almost kill the patient, as I mentioned a minute ago. But since these were so rare, they were not discovered until post-FDA. It was discovered when the product was in clinical use. Can you imagine what happened? They had, no, I think there was one of the largest pharmaceuticals. They didn't go bankrupt, but they had to pull the entire drug. 10 years of development, just to throw it in the dustbin. And that's why new drugs are so expensive, right? Because for every drug that makes it to market, there are going to be 100 ones that failed. Yes? They couldn't. They couldn't find a way to fix the drug. But again, there is no way at that point it's too late. At
not with current testing, but you could imagine this is kind of going to be your job in the future, right? That today we know much more about the genotypes and we have much more sequences. Would it be possible to already at this stage predict that based on the genetic variation we see in patients? No, ten, ten, this was, might have been 20 years ago, right? And at that point there was no way we could have known. But today we have the genetic information. I bet that the specific mutations that caused the problem are already in the sequence databases. Um, and we are gradually knowing what this genetic variation. Could you already hear some of it? There is a risk that this particular drug would interact with something else. And if this is 50%, we might either try to modify the drug very early on and prevent it. So that I'm not saying it's easy, but it's no longer, it's no longer completely impossible. So if you summarize this, the time to market, sorry, the time to patent is something like 10 years. And this is for a successful drug. It might take another two years for this to actually get approved by everybody. How long is a patent valid? Typically 20 years. In some cases in the pharmaceutical research, you have a chance to extend this by five years. But that means that by the time, and again, this is not just the first patent, uh, many of your earlier patents on the small molecules and everything will have happened much earlier. So you might have something in the ballpark of 10 years when you can sell and make money of your drug. And that's why drugs are priced the way they are. Cost might be something like 300, 400 million euros. And this is probably low. This keeps going up all the time because there are more and more requirements for drugs. Maybe 100, 200 scientists involved. <coughs> and these phases that go through, that really, the first part in the kind of is what you call discovery or discovery research. And this is really when you're looking at genomes. You're looking at your targets. Uh, this is the stuff that people, for instance, the SciLife Lab do a whole lot finding out new targets, is there something that could, and divine inspiration is good if it's successful. Um, this is very much becoming computerized. Today I would even say the majority of this stuff happens in computers now. At some point we're going to need to start testing things, high throughput screening. This is also something we're doing at SciLab Lab, not so much electrophysiology maybe, but at very large scale, if you have 10,000 compounds or something, could you test them? Is there if I have my small pet receptor here, can you find me something that might possibly be possible to turn into a drug? And then there are these libraries. I, mean, I think at Silahab we have a library of roughly a million molecules or so. And these are molecules that we have trace amounts of. And then you can either, well, in theory you could do it manually. We typically have machines do it. And you're, just gonna, you're gonna need some sort of assay. And the assay is just the name. There's some experiment by which I can test if I have my receptor here, and if I add this drug, does it change the function of the receptor? Now this, if it's an ion channel, I can try to measure the currents in the ion channels, as you're going to see on Wednesday. But I just, I need some way to measure, does, does my receptor or whatever it is work? And then you test this with 1,000 different chemicals, or a million. And if you're going to do it for a million, you probably don't want that as a PhD project, right? And that's why we use robots. So there's a lot of this is becoming robotized. And there is an increasing amount of companies where you can even do this remotely by writing Python scripts. So just the way you can rent, just the way that you can rent computer space on Amazon, there are increasingly labs in the world where you can rent lab space and control it with computers remotely, completely automated. Pretty cool. And at some point though here, you increasingly go more and more into the lab. Um, we have medicinal chemistry, combinatorial chemistry, still computers. And then at, when you're somewhere here, you're having this entire team of people. And then you sit down and meet every week. And so you have now created a new bunch of experimental tests here. Based on those, we're going to uh, decide how are we going to optimize the, care, the molecules in the computers the next two, three weeks. Then we need to order a new batch of 1,000 new compounds that some scientists say in uh, China, Asia, anywhere. Uh, we don't do it in Sweden that much. Um, that try to design for us. Or if it's a very rare molecule, I might even have a lab of organic chemists downstairs that can design a custom molecule for me. But then I can't order 1,000, then it's one or two. And then four weeks later, we test those again and we look, so the hypothesis we had four weeks ago, did it work? Better or worse? If it's better, we continue that direction. If it's worse, we need to choose another direction. 
And then gradually you become more and more preclinical here. And after that, we would have all the tests. So by the time you get to the tests, the development is really over. You can't change the drug. Once we get to the test, we have a drug. And the only question we then ask, is this drug good, yes or no? We don't change it anymore in tests. So that by when you get to preclinical, everything is settled. So all the actual research happens here, but all the costs are related to the testing. So let me do one more, two more slides. Um, so there are going to be a couple of steps that we need to go through. In particular, this preclinical part, finding a hit, seeing whether it has any effect, and optimizing it. And this is where all the computations come in. We typically need the protein structures. That might change, depending on how good you are the next 10 years. But for now on, we still need the structure. And what we do is that we need to find something, either in a database, with some sort of activity. Do you know what that is? It's roughly $10 billion, I think. More, no, probably $100 billion. Sorry? No, it's omeoprazole, uh, which is an enlosic for acid reflux. It's one of Sweden's biggest export successes ever, designed by Astra. And this was a drug that was actually found, and, uh, but turned out to be toxic. But they eventually realized by modifying this drug a bit, they could remove the toxicity and cause this to inhibit the acid reflux. Which is, uh, so omeoprazole is the real drug name. What all these companies then do, they come up with a name they can patent. So this was called originally Losec and then Prelosec and then uh, Nexium in the US, I think. Those are just marketing names. But the initial version of this drug was lousy. First it was toxic and you probably had to eat 10 kilos a day for it to have any effect, right? So that's why you need to go through a bunch of steps, try adding a methyl group there and see if you're changing that chain a bit, gradually changing the molecule a little bit, optimize it and get it to be better and better and better. And the second part is what you call lead optimization or lead optimization. So you would need, at this point I tried to isolate what is the part of this drug that is really responsible for the binding, right? Because if you have a large molecule, it might very well be that it's that particular part that creates the good part. And then we keep that part and try to redesign all the other ones to improve solubility, increase the efficiency. And what you do very much there is high throughput screening. And high throughput screening sounds advanced, but it's really the equivalent of a student pipetting 1,000 things. And instead of having students do that, we have robots do it. There are a few of these, like Satellite Lab. So you, maybe, you can maybe do 150,000 tests a day. And each of these tests, the chemicals might cost like 10 cents per chemical or so. So it's substantial amounts of money, but again, compared to the clinical test, is nothing. So here you want to find out, all over this library, what types of drugs might hit your receptor. Uh, if you're really lucky, out of those 150,000, there are 100 interesting hits, leads. But of course, the likelihood that those 100 is going to lead to a drug at this point is still virtually zero. But the point is that for any random receptor, there are quite a few things that will bind to it. So what then, well, I think one dollar here is probably, clo it's probably closer to 10 cents today. But it's still expensive. Not for one day, but if you operate this 365 days a year, it adds up. Now, of course, if those 100 are really good drugs, it's fine. But in general, you're not going to find anything there. So this really shouldn't work. Uh, chemical space is something like 10 to the power of 60 drug-like molecules, if they're going to be small and everything. Uh, if you randomly screen 10 to the power of 6 of those, the likelihood that you're going to find the best molecule, it doesn't even show on the chart, right? And in a few, these are actually real examples from recent studies. They tested 300,000 compounds. Zero. So let's assume that it was one. This was the old days. So it probably was one dollar. It cost you $300,000 for that experiment. Can you imagine if your boss is happy when you come back? I say that it's zero hits. But the point is, happened. actually, I don't think he was mad. Um, it happens. And then Crusain, another example, 200,000 compounds they tested, 146 hits. Well, which one do you think 
Which one of these do you think is better? Maybe, but it's also dangerous. This could be a molecule. Either this is a molecule that lots of things bind to, or it could be, I have no idea what database this was. It could also have been a different database, and this database contained lots of small molecules that will bind in many different places, right? At this point, we still know. This could be bad binders that will cause side effects. None of them are going to be efficient. So what you're then going to need to do, we're going to need to optimize this and get them to be better and better. And we still have four minutes, so I'll do a few more slides. So the other thing that we could do is somehow try to do this computationally. Uh, I'll explain what QSAR is in a second. Um, so instead of doing this in the lab, you could use a computer, a large computer. But you can't do this with a simulation or anything. It's too slow because we're going to need to do this. The point of a computer is not to do it 300,000 times, but the point of a computer is to be able to do it 300 million times, right? So we need to be very fast at predicting is this going to be efficient or not. So what you typically want to say is that Maybe we could do some sort of classification. Remember those Lipinski's rules? So find me, find all molecules that have five hydrogen bond donors and 10 hydrogen bonds acceptors that are small. I know for this particular receptor, it helps have negatively charged molecules. So find me everything that's negatively charged. So that is some sort of correlation between the structure of the drug and how good we think it's going to be at the receptor. And this has a name, QSAR. Quantitative Structure Activity Relationship. Uh, this sounds very fancy, but it's all this. Uh, just look at some rough correlation between molecules that might be good and what in general binds to this receptor. I'll come back to this slide in a second. So that, well, this is a very simple example for anesthetics that I already mentioned, right? That we know that things are, the more hydrophobic things are, the better it's going to be as an anesthetic. It's a very simple structure activity relationship. There are more advanced ones in the literature. And what this enables you to do is that suddenly you can screen something like a million compounds in the computer. Uh, oh, sorry, a million compounds in the lab. Uh, while in the computer, you can increase this by at least 1,000 fold. There is no way, no matter how many robots you have, there is no company in the world that could screen a billion molecules in the lab. So the point here is not necessarily that you need to be better than the lab, right? So what you possibly lose in efficiency or accuracy, you can compensate by volume here. Because if I test 1,000 times more drugs, I'm more likely to find the really good one. So what QSAR typically does is that we look at things like, well, maybe how large the molecule is, charge, dipole moment, the surface, is it a polar or, hydropho polar or hydrophobic surface? How many hydrogen bonds do you have? Is it soluble in water versus soluble in octanol? And this sounds just as horrible as, this is just as horrible as it sounds. But at this point, I don't need a perfect drug. I just need something to start from. If you give me something to start from, we can then try to optimize it and refine it. And we will look at that way after the break. But at this point, if you just find me something that might possibly be able to bind, let's say that blue are hydrogen bond donors, the uh, cyan there are hydrogen bond uh, acceptors, and then there's some charges or something, just find something that is roughly the right shape and that it might work. So there are some, this is the last slide before the break, I promise. There are some advantages here. This is super fast. It might take a millisecond per compound or something. So you can screen an insanely large database. It might very well be larger than a billion molecules today. And we do find some ligands. The problem is that you're only going to be able to find the things you already know. Because I told you to look for things that weighed 400 and that had two hydrogen bond donors and one hydrogen bond acceptor. Well, I just told you what to look for. You're not going to find anything that doesn't fulfill that. And what if there was an amazing molecule that was hydrophobic without hydrogen bonds instead? You will never find it because you already choose to discard all those molecules. Uh, this is gradually giving way to deep learning methods based on machine learning. And it's some of the hottest things that are happening in the industry right now. Can we rather, and here, here we're very much trying to describe the physics, right? You're counting the hydrogen bonds. But can't we let a computer train this instead? Show the computer all the drugs that have been successful and show them all the things that bind say to ligand gated ion channels and tell the computer find more things like this. Don't let me say how many hydrogen bonds there should be. 
and this seems to work. Um, and again, deep learning is so new that's only been around four or five years. But there are a whole lot of amazing papers being published now at how good it is at finding drugs. So I think that in a few years, you're going to forget about QSR and you're going to say deep learning. 10.30 exactly. Let's meet here at 11. And I'm going to talk about pharmacophores and a bit how we do the optimization. So we mentioned QSAR, right? There are some slightly more advanced ways you can do this. Because at some point, we need to describe to the computer what we're looking for. And there is a concept related to QSAR that is called pharmacophore that you should at least have heard of. So what a pharmacophore does, at this point, I have my molecule, say my blood pressure related receptor or something. And I know I found some drugs here that have a little bit of effect and I would like to find more because I don't have any blockbuster amazing thing yet. And what you then can start do, if you look at this molecule and I maybe even have two or three hits here, I can start, you know what, for all of these hits, there appears to be a oxygen there and nitrogen there and then I have four hydrophobic rings that doesn't really say that much, but maybe I know there has to be a nitrogen there, an oxygen there, and a hydrophobic ring between them. So maybe you can start to describe all these pairwise distances, so roughly in space. Forget about all the details here. So maybe you say that hydrophone donor and then something polar, a ring here and a ring here. A super simple summary of the molecule. What are just the overall properties of the molecule? And this is called the pharmacophore. So just if we have had this very simple models of proteins, a pharmacophore is a very simple model of the overall properties of a molecule that binds in this pocket. And the reason for doing this is that rather than now trying to search for any molecule, I can say that, okay, if these are the properties that the molecules have to have, I can go into the database and search for molecules that fulfill that pattern. And there are large pharmacophore databases. So then I can find other molecules that at least have high likelihood of refining this pattern. And this is also something that you do every week in this four, uh, four to five week cycle of the pharmaceutical development projects. You need to find more and better drugs. There are a bunch of common elements here. Uh, Virtually all drugs, I see, they have these two, three, four hydrogen bonds, rarely more, uh, sorry, hydrogen bonds, uh, aromatic rings, rarely more because then they become too large. You might have a couple of hydroxyl groups, again, they can't just be hydrophobic, so that the space is fairly large, but we also tend to reuse the space quite a lot. So these are a bunch of examples of full agonists against a particular molecule. So the point is, can you then try to somehow describe what are the common features here, right? It's not entirely easy, but there you have the hydroxyl, hydroxyl, hydroxyl. So there are some patterns here that are a bit common. And there might not even be one pharmacophore that can describe all of these. But maybe we can define some sort of average property of all these molecules. That has one aromatic part here, hydrophobic part there, need a hydrogen bond donor over there, and then two hydrogen bond, say, acceptors. It's not going to be stellar. It can actually be pretty bad, but it's better than nothing. We can also say, I hate Microsoft. Sorry. That's why I don't even have it installed on my computer. Uh, you can also somehow try to describe how large it is and what the amount of volume it excludes. What is the volume in this part of the molecule? So say some sort of the overall shape of the molecule. And I'm well aware how fuzzy this sounds, but it is fuzzy. There is no simple answer to just find your molecule. And the reason why this is fuzzy is that up to this stage, we haven't used anything about the protein structure. And that's why we're hand waving. We're blind. You don't know what receptor you're trying to target. I know that, well, other molecules in general that tend to bind to this receptor tend to have roughly this shape. Find more things like it. And that's why we're fumbling in the dark. So the obvious way to stop fumbling in the dark is to have some information about the structure. So that's structure-based drug design. And that is very much where we've been heading the last decade or two. So most modern drug design tends to be structure-based already on the hit phase, so that I want to use some sort of computational prediction to find out what are good hits. If I know my receptor structure, can't I just try to calculate molecules that would be good hits there? 
Yes. So in theory, uh, maybe. Um, so the problem is that first getting antibodies defined to these very small molecules is hard, right? Um, the other problem is that if you want to develop a new antibody, it's expensive. It's several thousand dollars per antibody if you're lucky. And if I want to test a billion molecules, so that we'll get there later, but we're still at the stage, I just need to cast my net as wide as possible here. Uh, I don't care about the accuracy or precision yet. I now I just need to find anything. I'm desperate. Um, so let's stay desperate a while before we do the expensive stuff. So the docking, if you look at this superficially, given that structure, I want to find the best ways to put two molecules together. So best somehow means I need to rank them. I need to find which ones are good or bad. And if I'm going to do, need to do this for a billion molecules, I don't have time to do it accurately. I need to find a super fast method to do it. And I also need to somehow find the best ways to put ways to put the molecules together. There is more than one way to put molecules together, right? So I'm going to need to test this. In theory, you could do this in a long molecular simulation, but that way I might be able to test one molecule. I'm going to need to test a billion. So I'm going to need something to, that is way faster and super fast at searching here. So if you look at a receptor here, um, here's a small molecule uh, bound in dopamine. Maybe you start by understanding the pharmacophore and then we can select the database where the pharmacophore looks roughly like this and then you find 10,000 molecules like that and for each of those 10,000 molecules, well, small as this is, it's nothing like a protein, right? But you can rotate around that bond, you can rotate around that bond, you can rotate around that bond, that bond, that bond, that bond and that bond and you can also rotate the entire molecule. So we're already talking about something like 10 to 15 degrees of freedom here for a tiny molecule. And then you can rotate it in space and translate it and bind it in different pockets. You have 0.1 seconds for that. Because again, I'm going to need to do this for a billion of them. And if you compare this, <laughs> it's basically this. It's really not more fancy than this. Yes. <laughs> uh, we need to do this super quick. Round peg square hole doesn't work. Throw it away. Um, triangular peg square hole doesn't work. Throw it away. Eventually, square peg square hole. Okay, let's keep that. And then we try more and more. There's slightly more degrees of freedom here. But you're not really more fancy than a two-year-old just trying it. The point here is not that the two-year-old knows a whole lot about physics, right? You can test this anyway and we're going to try pretty much the same approach. So that we typically foc take one ligand, we're not going to move the ligand too much, see if I can change, you might have to change at least the side chains in your protein a little bit to allow me to binding, but at this point I don't care about doing this accurately, Boltzmann, it just, is it completely impossible to bind this molecule, throw it away? If there is, if there is a small chance that it might work, let's save it for later. But in this case, you're going to need a structure, either a crystal structure if you're rich, or you can build an homology model. Ten years ago, I would have been exceptionally skeptic to try to do docking based on a homology model because the homology models were too low quality. That is no longer true. There are a bunch of really successful studies where people have been able to docking and find things that actually work based on homology models. But for this to work, there are going to be two things we need. You're going to need to sample things. We're going to need to test tons of things here, and, but it has to be very quick. And for each of these tests, I also need to assign some sort of score to it so that I can say which ones are good versus bad later on. And the point is that your guess is as good as mine. You need to reduce the amount of sampling as much as we can here. So what you typically do is that you might only, we keep all these aromatic rings fixed and then we only rotate along a handful of bonds here, maybe four or five bonds. The fewer degrees of freedom you have, the better. And then try a few different ones. And then we don't allow this to sample everything. We might have a small box, say one nanometer by one nanometer by one nanometer, because uh, this is the likely binding site. I'm only going to test inside this specific binding site. And I can't afford to sample every single angle, so let's just pick 10 degrees variations. This is sloppy. Sloppy is fine here, but I have to be fast because I only have 0 0.1 seconds. And maybe you have 100 confirmations per second or so, and then we use 10 computers, so that would be 
100 confirmations in 0 0.1 seconds. If you did this exhaustively, it would take 200 years. So you simplify, simplify, simplify. And one way of simplifying this is that you find some things, either molecules or samples that work fine. And then you see what score, and then you test 10 of them or 100. And then we get some scores. Some of these, they look really promising. And in that case, we extract those confirmations and then we mutate them either by adding a few other groups or by if this particular molecule that we tested in this particular hood, this looked really good, but I only tested it in angles of 10 degrees increments. So let's throw away the 999 ones that did not work, keep the one that worked and then test this again, but now in one degree increments. So try to only spend time on the things that look promising. And the reason for keeping one of a thousand, if we start with a billion and then we first take it down to a million and then maybe to 1,000, somewhere along the road we might, hopefully we're spending most of the computational resources on the few molecules that work. Here too, we don't necessarily have to obey the laws of physics. That's an advantage of computers. So here I said that we could take one molecule and try to move it, right? But you could also take a large molecule. Let's break this molecule into pieces. And then we bind the different pieces in different parts here. And then we see, look, if we take the pieces here that looked good, and then we try to more or less randomly grow these molecules into larger molecules here. And when we do so, can we grow something that fills the entire cavity and that looks good? And hopefully we're going to find some molecules that are better than others, while the molecules that would end up bumping into the protein or itself, we discard those. And then we repeat, repeat, repeat. And the reason why we can do this fairly quickly is that we use fairly horrible scores. So all the stuff we learned at the beginning of this course is valid, but we don't necessarily have time. We could use an entire force field, but that gets expensive. And I can't have all that water. That's too expensive. So maybe we can even do, be even more empirical. We say, if there is a chance that you would form a hydrogen bond here, let's call that plus five is good. Or minus five if you think the low is good. Um, if things might bump into each other, we say that's bad and assign a completely arbitrary score to it. So we can just, and we can kind of calibrate the score as we go so that if experiments confirm my scores, we keep it. You can even do this with statistics. If we know that it's very common that an oxygen is close to a nitrogen because they would form a hydrogen bond, we can say if you have an oxygen and a nitrogen within 3.5 angstrom, the typical distance of a hydrogen bond, that's good. Let's call it minus five. While if you have two oxygens facing each other, we know that they would likely repel. So let's say that's plus 10, that's bad. And then you somehow have to add all these things together and uh, hopefully, then you're also gonna, sorry, one more thing. Uh, you're also gonna need to use some sort of grid for this. It's easy to show it here. So I take my molecule, but instead of simulating this gradually through space, I just place this at different grid points or something. And then I evaluate for each atom here, how likely is it to bump into something? And there are a couple of different programs here that do this in different ways. But the point is they do it fast, even sloppily. But in contrast to MD simulations, we can do this at super high throughput. Test a billion molecules. This is probably the only course you're going to see that we don't care about accuracy. Um, does this work? It obviously does, otherwise I wouldn't be telling you about it, but rather, why does it work? I would even go as far as say, on average, it kind of doesn't work, right? If you test one molecule here and it has a low score, would you be willing to take that as a drug to eat it? Good. Um, so on average, it has very low correlation. But is the correlation zero? There is a slight correlation, right? If you score well here, you can probably accept that it's slightly likelier than random that you're going to be a good drug. And if you now test a billion drugs, let's, let's be extreme here. Let's say that it's only one in a, once in a one molecule out of a thousand that we test uh, would be good. So let's see, but I, 
I scan through a billion molecules. Out of those one billion molecules, I let the docking go down first to one million. And then in a second stage of docking or something, I tell, you know what, out of these one million molecules, rank them and then select the 1,000 best molecules. The 1,000 best molecules I could actually test in the lab. I can't test a million and I can't test a billion, but I can test 1,000 molecules in the lab. So as long as there is one out of your one million molecules that you actually identified correctly and put among your 1,000 top ones, I will test, I will find it because I'm gonna test 1,000 molecules. So the point is that I don't need to find the best molecule. I just need something to start working on, right? And as long as the probability is not quite zero, the likelihood that you found something, and again, if you, if you give me 500 great molecules out of the 1,000, I'm gonna be ecstatic. But I only need one that's really good. So docking is very much about improving the odds a bit. It's not about predicting things in the computer and never testing it in the lab, but it's if you only have a chance to test 1,000 things in the lab, Docking helps you test the 1,000 molecules that are most likely to be useful. And for that to work, we need to be able to scan through a million of them in a day, so that maybe you can do a billion in total. And effectively, you are predicting a binding free energy. We're going to talk more about free energies tomorrow. It's just that we typically, we typically don't call it free energy. We say that it's a docking score. And I think these are a couple of examples of molecules that, that you've gradually grown in and got them work better. And red and blue here would mean that it's a favorable electrostatic interactions. Um, so in many cases, it actually works. Not in the sense that, each, that the predicted binding here is proportional to the experimental binding, but out of the things that you select, we tend to have some molecules that are pretty good. And ah, we can use the example here. These two targets I showed before, the lact lactamase, out of 300,000 compounds you tested, experimentally they found zero. And then when they did a large docking run, and I think they did this against zinc, which is a database, it's a, it's a recursive abbreviation. Zinc stands for zinc is not commercial. So it's a large research database with roughly 100 million molecules. And you can actually, molecules that you can order fairly cheaply and test them. And when they docked this against zinc, they found two hits. It's pretty good, right? So by docking at first, they managed to find two hits that actually worked experimentally. When they just tested 300,000 things in the experiments, they found zero. And suddenly that docking solution doesn't seem so bad anymore. Or crusane, this other target, I, I don't remember how many docking things we tested experimentally. That, Again, when they tested 200,000 compounds experimentally, they got 146 hits, which is kind of nice. But if you go and do a thesis project, what is it, next spring at SciLife Lab, if you tell your advisor, okay, you would like to do a screen here now, and that's going to cost you $200,000, they would likely just look at you. Or you can do it with docking and get 1,000 or 500 compounds. So typically in the lab, we might prefer to only test 100 or so. And out of those 100, maybe you found five. That cost to the lab is now $100. I bet your PI is going to say, go right ahead and order. So the point is not to find more money, but this is orders of magnitude cheaper. And at this point, even the 146, I don't need 146 drugs. I only need one drug. And at this point, I just need something to start optimizing. Five is awesome. So docking doesn't find all hits. You even throw away a lot of good ranking hits. But that's sad, right? What says that? But what if the best hit was something we throw away? It might be that those five molecules, there might have been something even better, the sixth molecule that was by far the best binder, and we missed it. Well, such is life. If you look at, if you look at Nexium, Nexium is, this, again, the molecule that we gained that AstraZeneca probably sold $100 billion worth of over 10 years. What says that Nexium is the best proton pump inhibitor theoretically possible? Nothing. And it's even true that it wasn't. So that the very first generation of omeprazole, 
they improved the drug after five, six years and tweaked it a bit and actually made it more efficient. And then they got a new patent even. Uh, so they were able to extend it a while. So that you don't need the best possible drug. You just need a good drug. So good is good enough. You don't need to be best. This, you can make this as complicated as you want to because as computers are getting faster and faster, today we, we might try to allow for the receptor, say the, both the backbone and the side chains in your receptor moving a bit as you're trying to bind the drug. And again, this might not sound so extreme, but in addition to the five degrees of freedom in your ligand, now we might add another 25 in the proteins and the complexity here will grow exponentially. So this is a very common use of supercomputers all over Europe, that you would like to run tens of thousands of tests day and night. And as expensive as those computers are, they are super cheap compared to doing this experimentally. And at this point, we're happy. We do have a drug. And you have a drug that works under with some minor details, uh, some minor limitations. Lots of side effects and eating five kilos of medicine per day. And this has to do with the efficiency of binding. Again, you have a lot of protein in your bodies and this drug might not bound, bind super hard. And to get this drug to bind to all of my receptors in my nervous system, I would need a lot of the drug because this just has to do with the equilibrium coefficients between the unbound versus the bound state. If I want to force this so much so that every drug, every receptor has bound a copy of my drug, I will need a very high concentration of my drug in general. Unless my drug is an insanely good binder and in, on average molecules are not. This is not going to work of course. So to improve this, we now need to optimize the drug and optimization is really about binding, improving the binding coefficients. And you might, you should probably have heard about this at least. So when we measure binding, you typically measure binding in a concentration. And that's roughly going to be the concentration we have in equilibrium. So that a millimolar binder is a very lousy binder. So you're going to need a millimolar concentration of this in the blood for it to be 50-50 bound to all your receptors. There is no way you would take that as a drug. Micromolar binder? Uh, you're not going to make millions of that. And then you go down to say nonomolar binder or even picomolar binder. Here you start to be happy. So we're going to need to improve the binding affinity between the drug and receptor with something like three to four orders of magnitude here. Oh, sorry. The factor three between all of these, nine to 12 orders of magnitude. So you're going to need something that's um, astronomically good at binding things. And the way you do this, this phase is called lead optimization. And there's a lot of computers here. Uh, you can keep doing more docking runs and everything. Uh, at this point, if you started out from an homology model and you start having a hit, and this looks promising and everything, in virtually all cases, this is when you're gonna go down to the biophysics department and the pharmaceutical company and say, look, we need an X-ray structure of the Lindahl receptor here. Um, it doesn't matter if it's going to cost 10 million because it's worth it. There is no way we're going to get a picomolar binder unless we understand that. At this point, you need to really understand the binding in detail. You need to understand all the biology of the binding. You're going to do, start doing animal, not animal tests of the drug, right? But animal tests to understand the biology, maybe in primates or so. And then you will start doing more and more advanced calculations. Uh, design molecules, sit down, you, sit, you literally have people sitting down and tweaking this first manually. Today we have more and more computers helping us. Um, I th I, yes, I think I have an example here. HIV-1 protease. This was the fr an, an inhibitor. So you see that it's an inhibitor that turned off the effect of a receptor. So this is a drug that you started out from this hit. Um, it's a diol, it has two alcohols and it's symmetric and it had some activity that was likely lousy. So the first thing they did here is that they went from this molecule and created a pharmacophore. So that you needed, and then you have three pairwise distances here, you had two phosphates and then an H hydrogen bond donor or acceptor in the middle. And then you use this to search a database and in the database one of the molecule hits we found, well not we, they found was this one that roughly fulfilled this pharmacophore. And then you 
took that drug and take to make it even simpler. Um, so then you have two phosphates here and uh, a hydroxyl group there and oxygen there. So this was the first design that they then tested. The, this one they synthesized and then tested. Uh, I don't know what affinity it had actually, but hopefully better than the initial one. And then we wanted to get this two alcohols back. So we extended it and made it a diol again. Uh, we also added urea. And at some point they realized that this binding was not that great in the receptors. So you wanted to optimize the stereochemistry a bit to get it to bind with very high affinity. So then you keep adding more groups here to get the stereo affinity to be a bit better. And then eventually you ended up with this drug probably after another 50 rounds. This was the drug that was selected for phase one studies. But the point is it was already, all the important steps here were done in computers. And then of course you need to test that the predictions we made in computers, they make sense. So you periodically, every four to six weeks, you synthesize the three, four best predictions you had this far. And of course, occasionally there were mistakes and setbacks. Um, obviously they didn't show that in the presentations. Uh, but in many, and usually in general, you made progress over a few years and you gradually become better and better and better and you bind it better and better and better. So this drug, a few years later, this became the first, the first ever drug that you could use to treat HIV. It was a computationally designed drug. The first computationally, the first drug on the market where the entire, I wouldn't say the entire, but the preclinical phase that you really started. This was not something you found in a plant or something in nature. It was a completely artificial design made in computers. This is how all modern drug design happens. I even think we might even have a picture of it. Yes, this is what it looks like. It's still being used. Today we probably have 10 more HIV fighting drugs and I would guess the vast majority of them are computationally designed. No, sorry, my bad, this is not that drug. Occasionally it helps to read my notes. Uh, this is another blockbuster drug. Uh, you can even see that it's not identical to the first one. What is this? Obviously, uh, you know, this is Lipitor with another computationally designed drug. You know what Lipitor is? It's a dream drug if you're a pharmaceutical company. Uh, Atorvastatin, uh, it doesn't tell you or me anymore. This is the drug that helps against high levels of cholesterol in your blood. And again, middle-aged wrist, or middle-aged to elderly rich westerns that weigh a few kilos too much, they buy this drug. The other thing, and this one's so horrible, but this is also a drug, you, can't, you don't really cure the disease, right? Because people keep eating too much fat. So that they're gonna take it for the rest of their lives. And this is how you make an insane amount of money. I think the sales a few years, when it was at the peak 10 years or so ago, it sold for $15 billion a year. $150 billion total. <laughs> and then the patent expired. <laughs> so nowadays there are generics that are just copies of this drug. So why does it take a while for the sales to go down? Is it that people are stupid and they don't realize that the patent has expired? First, it takes time to create new drugs, but you can imagine all these other companies, they're, they're sitting here, they're prepared, right? The day has expired. So on any modern drug, you don't just have one patent. Um, so you probably have a hundred or 500 patents. You have a patent on the molecule, but I also make sure that I have a patent on the way of making my molecule. And if I, halfway through this process, I go, ah, there's a smarter way to make my molecule, I'll patent that too. I make sure that I patent the, uh, the way we prepare the, uh, the pills or whatever. I patent everything. So I, I literally create a bomb carpet out of patents. And if you as much as tread on one of my patents here, I'm gonna sue you to death. Um, because this, this, again, it might not sound like a big deal, right? But three, four, five years, 10 billion per year, that's $50 billion. It pays a few lawyer salaries. So that you try, you do everything you can to try to extend the patent protection. The other question is, in theory, all these fancy things we've been through in this course, can we use things like molecular simulations for drug design? Historically, the answer to this has been no, because it's been too expensive. But this is changing. Uh, I'm gonna show you, yes, let's see if it starts. This is an example of a very long simulation using these machines that I told you before. Do you see that this drug here is binding? And I think this is something that covers like hundreds of microseconds. 
And now this drug found its binding site deeply buried there. And this corresponds to binding site that has later been confirmed experimentally. So while it's not their primary goal, I know David Shaw was this guy, the uh, investment banker from New York that started. This is of course partly their goal, that they want to be able to sell this type of machines to the pharmaceutical industry. Because instead of having all these scientists employed, if you could basically let the computer figure it out and press a button, there are companies that would be willing to pay a lot compared to determining all the structures. Uh, so there are, I would still say this is on the level, there are a handful of cases of the literature where this has worked. On the other hand, when I was at your age, this was science fiction. We couldn't even dream of it. So give this another 10 years, this will likely be the norm in many cases. We also know that despite all these shortcomings and simulations and everything, it's, this is not a, this is the entire rest of the structure. And the reason why it's a bit fluctuating is that the simulation and the X-ray are not completely identical. The gray or black part here is the structure, both of the protein and the drug in the X-ray structure, while the orange one is in the simulation. And the simulation did not use any knowledge of the drug from the X-ray. So it's not that we placed it there. We placed the drug in the solvent, and then we let it try to find the binding spot. So that the simulation here was pretty darn good at predicting exactly where the molecule should bind. Same thing here. The orange one is the simulation. So we're talking about differences in maybe 0 0.1 angstrom in the placement of one atom there. And I would say that this, de this deviation is likely smaller than the resolution in the X-ray structure. So today, again, today we're at the point where this is start being useful. Give it another 10 years, it's going to be more efficient to do this in simulations than with X-ray crystallography. But in many cases, we might even know that this is the binding pocket. And while you can certainly argue that it's useful to search for it, if we know where the binding pocket is, it's a waste of time trying to find it, right? Well, what you would rather like to do is maybe test 1,000 different molecules. So what we then need to do for 1,000 different molecules, I would like to know how good is it for all these 1,000 different molecules to bind here and rank them. What determines that? Binding affinity. What is that? We need to calculate the free energy, right? What is the free energy of the molecule being bound compared to the molecule not being bound? There's a difference in free energy, a delta G. That is all binding affinity is. But this was not entirely easy to do because I can certainly calculate all the interactions, but what the interactions do not measure, they don't measure the entropy. And to get that entropy right, we're going to need to do a proper molecular simulation so that you actually sample all the different states. And this too used to be science fiction, but it works quite well. So this is a small toy protein, uh, which is called FK501 FK binding protein. And then they've calculated this for a bunch of different ligands that they had also taken these ligands and determined it experimentally. So you see that the relative error here might be something like half a kilocalorie per mole or something in binding over a fairly large range of molecules. So while it's not super cheap yet, molecular simulations, you can calculate the free energy in a computer without ever taking this into the lab. So why would you do that? If you could just order 1,000 compounds, this is stupid. Just because you can do it when a computer doesn't mean we should. So here is an example of this is you can spend, by spending a week in a computer, you can do something that completely replaces spending 30 minutes in the lab. No, well, the running cost of the computer is probably more expensive than the cost of doing that experiment in the lab. Well, but it took 30 minutes in the lab and it took me one week in the computer. Actually, so you're, you're on the right track here. The point is not that it costs the person standing 30 minutes in the lab. That's not the costly part. This was toy molecules. But imagine, and if, again, if these molecules, I told that there are these 100 molecules or so in this zinc. Zinc is not commercial database. But the likelihood of your best molecule being one of those 100 million. Again, 100 million sounds like a lot, but 100 million is just 10 to the power of 8. And then probably zinc is smaller. Zinc is probably 10 to the power of 6. The actual space of all potential molecules that we would like to test is 10 to the power of 60. 
there is no database with this molecule in. So in general, what's going to happen is that you sit in your computer and you now have a super advanced program and you come up that you're going to need this molecule and <laughs> I'm not going to draw everything here and then something there, something there, metal group there. Let's add whatever, some five member ring here. <laughs> your guess is as good as mine. I think that's going to be a great molecule. And then I have 100 of those. And then I call up my supplier and say, look, I need you to synthesize these molecules. I say, OK, we'll do that. We'll outsource that to our factory in Asia. It's going to be $5,000 per molecule. And that's cheap because you're common returning customers. So for this round that you're going to do, need to do the next three weeks, <coughs> just make the math. Do the math. $500,000 just to produce those molecules because they don't exist yet. Now, once you spent those $500,000, the cost of actually doing the experiment might be 1,000. <laughs> but producing new molecules is exceptionally difficult because they, they basically, you need to design a new reaction, right, to produce the molecule, and that can take four weeks if you're lucky. But doing the experiment is quick. So doing this in the computer allows us to do things cheaper, in particular if you want to do this with brand new molecules that nobody has yet designed. The other thing that we're increasingly learning to do is testing these small things I mentioned. What if, if I take this molecule and test it with or without a methyl group? Would it help to have a methyl group there? That is something that the computer, we're now down to doing this in hours. And you don't even need the computer. So what companies use is that they buy the computer time on Amazon. And then you have your computer and say, run this overnight. I would like the answers by tomorrow, 8 AM. So this is becoming way more common. And it allows us to go after molecules that nobody would dare to go after a decade ago because they were too expensive to produce. And it's also helping us understand that in many cases that just as we've talked about protein folding and that there, it's not just a matter of thermodynamics, right? It's also the kinetics. In quite a few cases, what determines whether the drugs are going to be efficient or not has to do with kinetic barriers. So if this orange molecule is moving in here, and I should have the native post there in gray, but the problem is that there are a bunch of waters that are bound there in the crystal structure. So for my molecule to get in there, I need to push those waters out. And what's then going to determine how efficient this is, is of course, is how quickly will I be able to get over that energy barrier. And can I then design a molecule that helps me just like the catalyst and the protein folding we spoke about, can you design a molecule where this energy barrier is lower so that it will bind faster? And this is not quite science fiction, but this is pretty much where the research front is when it comes to computational drug design, improving the kinetics of binding. So with that, I'm going to spend the last few minutes talking about the curious case of GPCRs here, where we're going to use this. Uh, and the reason for doing GPCRs is that first you should have heard a bit about them because they're important. And I can come back and show you some examples where we have used this successfully for GPCRs. So GPCR stands for G protein coupled receptor. So you have this receptor, which is a transmembrane domain here, and it's seven helices. And then they're coupled to this G protein on the other side of the cell. And what you have is that you have a neurotransmitter binding on the outside in the loops here. And then magic happens. So that when this binds, there is the protein undergoes a conformational change that signals to this G protein that then perpetuates the signal on the inside of the cell. And there are something like 900 genes in humans for this. So they do a, a vast variety of different functions, and not just one. And remember the thing I said about membrane proteins being the doors and windows of our cells? It's not just a toy word. This is why they are important. If you want to start regulate cells, you need to target them. You, this might not sound like a lot. When I was your age, the prevailing idea was that we will likely never ever find a protein, a structure for G protein coupled receptor. There are probably more than 25, there's probably 50 today or so. Because people had, people had spent decades trying to get it. Nobody had managed to do it. So that's, there were, people were generally accepting that we might be able to do some homology models or something, but they're going to be too difficult to crystallize. 
So the point is, in those days, it's not just that membrane proteins were difficult to crystallize. There were classes that nobody had ever been able to determine a single receptor. But then things, uh, sorry, that, but even before we had a structure, we know quite well that there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven transmembrane helices. So it's the poster child of simple membrane proteins, and this is the case where all this transmembrane helix prediction worked really well. And we could also predict the locations of the loops based on the charges. So we knew quite a lot about these proteins from bioinformatics. It's even more extreme than that. So bacteriorhodopsin that I showed you earlier, which is also a seven transmembrane helix, the first membrane protein structure we really got. It's homologous. It's, well, it's rather the same overall fold at least. It's not a GPCR, uh, but they are evolutionary related. So we kind of knew everything. We knew that there are seven transmembrane helices. We know the overall fold, and we know roughly what it looks like in the inside. And still, we can't determine the structure, and just knowing the rough structure doesn't help us because the devil is in the detail. We need to know exactly what the binding sites are. And the rhodopsin doesn't have these binding sites. The rhodopsin is not coupled to the G protein. So again, while well, superficially they like look the same, but unless you know exactly what the sites the roles of the sites are, it's useless. But the reason why I can show you that is that some 10 years ago, there were two structures published within one week of each other of the first structures of the G-protein coupled receptors. So there was a bit of row about this that Brian Kubilka and Ray Stevens, they were competing here too. So they were first collaborating and then somehow this collaboration broke down um, and they published things independently. And I'm partial because I, work, I worked in the same department where Brian was. Um, so I, I should not say who's right or wrong here. Um, but you can all, you all know what happened a few years later, right? Brian got, won a Nobel Prize together with his old mentor. And I think the Nobel Foundation went around. So Brian has been a powerhouse. And in particular, Brian frequently says that he doesn't work with GPCRs, but he works with a beta-2 adrenergic receptor, which is one specific GPCR. Um, so Brian and his advisor won the Nobel Prize for their studies of G-protein coupled receptors, and Ray Stevens was actually let out. So Ray Stevens run a very large crystallography group, and since they have been able to determine entire trees, tons of different structures. And you can imagine how important this is for the pharmaceutical companies, right? This is one quarter of all drug targets. So in this case, there have been several companies that have paid these groups to determine structures. And the agreement then is that the structure will eventually become public. But because these companies pay so much money, they get one or two years of head start. So you have two years when your company will have the structure when I promise not to show it to anybody else. But in return for us doing this, we will get take $10 million from you. And after two years, we will be able to release this to the public. Which you can say, you can certainly argue about that, but the other alternative would likely be that they would do it themselves and then the structure would never be available. So I, I think that's, it's a reasonable way to fund the research. But the point is that the second we have structures, we can also start to determine exactly where are things binding. You have the look, we have the geometry of the binding site. We know what happens up here. We also, we will also see there are even co-crystals, that is X-ray structures with drugs bound, a carazosolol, was one of them, and I think there are two or three others now. So now we have the exactly right protein, we have exactly the right binding pocket, we even know exactly how some of these drugs bind in the receptor, and this is like night and day. So suddenly there's been an explosion in what we can do and how we can start to design drugs. Uh, so if you get at the first projection maps and essentially that first high resolution structures or something, sorry, there's a, This is not the term. The first complex structures, that is, G proteins with ligands bound. Uh, it confused me a bit. The first active state structures were in 2008, and nowadays we even have NMR structures. And at some point here, we no longer talk about individual structures, right? You see, we have classes of structures, human, mouse, rat, active structures, intermediate active structures, because just as the ion channels, these structures will go under through different processes. And to really be able to stabilize the active state or the inactive state, you're going to need to understand many of these. And a few years ago, instead of just having X-ray structures, uh, Ron Dror et al., who was 
part of this David Shaw group, they were even able to do the first simulations. Here's the ligand. You're going to see that it binds. And then I think you will also see the molecule going through a state change. So there it binds. And when this binds, and now we speed this up a bit. <laughs> Eventually, you see this helix is moving out, right, and everything. And you can actually, just looking at this as a movie is not so fancy, but the point is comparing this to X-ray structures. But you can see this actually caused the molecule to move from one conformation that we've seen in X-ray to another conformation that we've also seen in X-ray. So suddenly you can see how the ligand binding induced the conformational shift. And here we're just showing the transmembrane part, but the point is that this then leads to this earthquake that will cause the interactions between through the G protein to change and then cause the signal on the inside of the cell. Here too, we're pretty darn good. Pink is the simulation. Gray is the crystal structure. So as when, you're, when you're sitting with a single simulation and trying to predict it, you can easily tear your hair because it's so slow and everything. But I think it's pretty scary how accurate some of these things are. It's not going to... It's not going to replace all experimental work, but I think chemistry, as so many other researchers, uh, research areas, is increasingly becoming a computational field. And people who would never see themselves as computer people are increasingly working computation. Sorry, this is another way of looking at it. So there's a time here from zero to, micro, uh, to five microseconds, and red is the part that we explored initially or early on, and then the, the color goes through purple and eventually blue here. This tells you how the molecule, after roughly five microseconds, bound. So five microseconds in around 2011 or so, that was a very long simulation. Today, this is something you can do during a thesis project, at least if you have access to a bit of supercomputing time. And we also know, and you can actually find this out through the simulation, that all these states we go through corresponds that you have an unbound state, you go through a first barrier, and then you bound, bind in that extracellular vestibule do you remember, you saw the molecule that it first spent a bit of time in the upper part of the protein, right? And then after a while, it made a transition to a lower part. So that's going to be a second barrier, and then we end up in the bound state. So everything you learned about protein folding applies here too. And if you then want a drug that's more efficient, right, and everything, you're going to need to think about this. You need a low free energy here, but you also need barriers to stabilize it, and you need a molecule that's efficient enough that you can get over the barrier and bind. And I, I'm not going to spend much time on this. Um, there are a lot of statistics we can do here, too, and particularly if you start comparing different proteins. Um, so of the, all these different proteins, what are the interactions you have between different helices and everything? And I'm not going to go through this in detail. But the point is that out of these 900 genes or so, maybe we have, say, 200 significantly different GPCRs. I'm just guessing there. Uh, and each of this GPCR is going to have a slightly different binding site with slightly different properties that binds slightly different neurotransmitters. And of course, the neurotransmitter that binds to the first one here is not going to bind to the other 899. So again, the devil is in the detail. It's not just enough to find, just because you found something that binds to one GPCR. Well, first, if you want to develop a drug, you need to make sure that your drug only binds to the one GPCR you want to target, not the other 899 GPCR. Because if it binds to all of them, you're going to wreak havoc of the entire cellular signaling. So you only want to control one out of 900 different genes. But we're pretty good at that. Um, there are even many other sites here that you will almost... Ah. This is another example of a molecule first binding in the upper part here. And there are even, there are two, depending on the conformation of the molecule here, you can have slightly different sites occupied. What I haven't showed you there, though, is that here we only looked at the G protein, not the entire signaling, sorry, the G protein coupled receptor, not the entire signaling in the G protein itself. And that's something that Brian Kobilke in particular continued to work on for several years. And in 2011, they determined the structure of the entire complex, including the G protein on the inside. 
And you can imagine when you have this, we can start to, start to say that how is the G protein coupled receptor? Well, how is the ligand binding changing the structure of the G protein in green? How is the G protein upon the ligand binding, how does it undergo a conformational change that somehow changes the interaction in the yellow protein? What will that lead to in the yellow protein? How will that change the information with the beta sheet domain there? It's pretty complicated. Uh, but what we know, both based on their experiments and simulations actually, is that we have identified the helices here, how these helices move when the ligand, bi ligand binding occurs, and how the entire helix here is undergoing this conformational change. And that is one of the reasons why this simulation I showed you before was published in a quite high impact journal, that they were able to show that as you move from the active state and bind the ligand, you will first spend quite a lot of time in intermediate states, just as in protein folding, and then eventually you move over to an inactive state here that I think that black dot corresponds to where the simulation ended up and formerly the x-ray structure is somewhere down here. That is the x-ray structure of the active state. And they can trace every single helix here and really show how the activation happened. And if you think that that was the end of it, as recently as last year, um, no, I say they might, yes, it was last year. And your tensin 2 receptors, also receptors very much related to the, uh, the heart functionality and everything. New structures. And we were able to explain the selectivity and diversity and angiotensin 2 receptors. The cool thing with this structure is that it was neither an X-ray structure nor a cryogen structure, but one based on free electron lasers, which is a very fancy new technique to determine structures that they're building one down. They're building one at Stanford and one down in Europe, and I think we're going to see more and more of this. And what the free, a free electron laser does is pretty much it evaporates the protein, not just pretty much, it does evaporate. It completely kills the protein because you're shining an exceptionally strong laser at it. But before the protein has time to break into pieces, you manage to capture a snapshot of it. So then you can take structures that correspond to a millisecond time resolution or something, the type of intermediate states we spoke about. The other thing that happened last year is that there was a major merger. So it was a small drug firm called Ojeda that specialized in GPCRs that was bought by one of the major pharmaceutical companies. Do you see what type of sums we're talking about here? Yeah, it's like one, it's probably one fiftieth of Spotify or something. Um, I think Spotify is quite a lot of hype. I think these companies have more substance in the long term. Uh, it's very important. In the long term, I think we're all going to be more willing to pay for blood pressure drugs than music online. Um, actually, I think Spotify's evaluation is probably reasonable if they have 15 billion customers or so, but <laughs> there aren't that many humans. My point here is that this is hot. Uh, the other part that's super hot is the peptide drugs I spoke about. This is a slightly older, but almost 10 years ago, uh, AstraZeneca bought a British company called Medivine. And I think the sum there was, I don't remember, it must, probably was $1 billion or something. Uh, and that is a small company specializing in protein drugs, biologicals, as you call it. Um, Sorry, I didn't have a slide about that. That is the other really hot thing. Because with the biological, you're not, the problem with everything I showed you here is that you're somewhat limited to these small hydrophobic compounds, right? And they will have side effects. With biologicals, you can suddenly use the entire toolbox that everything you learned about protein structure. You only have 20 amino acids to build things from. Uh, but if you can then predict structures, if you can design antibodies or something, and in particular, can you take existing antibodies exactly what you asked about before. Well, antibodies are large and inefficient, so can we somehow try to extract just the small binding domain and express just the small binding domain that is much smaller, more efficient, more stable? Can we then target this to redesign the binding domain so that if I now have a cancer target and I know this on this particular cancer cell, it tends to express a lot of protein ABC. So can I then redesign my binding domain from the antibody to specifically bind to these ABC proteins. And then I can I somehow then use this antibody to kickstart my immune defense and kill just the cancer cells. And there are drugs. There are already drugs in clinical, uh, the various phases of clinical trials on this. And there are a few Japanese companies that are doing super cool things when they combine, they're basically using computational design for this. And we see just a few months ago, we applied for a research project together with three or four 
Europe-based companies. So we might start to do this quite a lot too experimentally. Very hot. We're not going to make a billion dollars, so I'm more into it from the research side. I think that's pretty much it. We're going to be able to finish early today. Uh, there's only one question for me. Tomorrow I'm going to try different things. I've taken you through these things and asked you questions. Tomorrow I'm going to be quiet. So I'm going to ask you to lead the discussion and talk about this. Partly what, well, do talk about the things that we've covered today. I'm going to be able to answer questions, but I want, you will have to ask me questions and then I will respond or you can talk between you. But I won't explicitly ask you the questions. And then on Friday, I'll bring some candy to get you to ask questions. Um, the point here is that there are certainly problems with drug design. In particular, we have, it doesn't work to find trace molecules anymore. The take home message for you is that is the optimistic one. There are a ton of new, very efficient methods we can use, but we need to get better at using them efficiently. The other part that I haven't discussed about here is that you should also get better at introducing transcriptomics and genomics in this. But that was more the bioinformatics course. So with that, it's 10 to noon. Let's finish here and then we'll meet again tomorrow 9 a.m. Then we're going to talk about free energy.